Thank you, John. And as John hinted, Lurgy has gone through the Owen household, unfortunately. Hannah and I have been the worst affected, but uh, thank you for your prayers this morning for those of you who were praying. Uh, let's come before the Lord now and pray once more. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your word. We thank you for its lively stories. We thank you for the truth. We thank you for the power of the Spirit and pray that he would come now and help us to hear your voice and to go out from here changed because you have spoken to us. Talk to us and help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the young lad lay there in bed, gripped by fear. Rigid, unable to move, he was clammy, he was breathless, longing that sleep would take hold and that his dreams would be sweet. For at least in the depth of sleep and the realm of his dreams, his mind would be drawn away from the object of his terror. But who was he kidding? Fear had so gripped him, its cold grey limbs wrapping round him and pulling him down. Sleep was never going to come. Now it wasn't that whether the light was on or off would make any difference to the boy. It wasn't a lack of light that wrought such fear in his mind. It was something altogether more chilling. If anything, at least the darkness would have meant that his nightmare would have come to him unseen. You may wonder, what evil thought had given birth to such paralyzing fear? What phantom could have so frightened a young boy? And where could these things have been learned? Well, the boy was me. And the spectre that overwhelmed my mind was introduced to me not by Tolkien or M.R. James or Scooby-Doo, but the wicked seed was sown, unfortunately, by the minister of the church I attended as a child. I was only young, but I knew, it seems, that bad theology was a dreadful horror. More real and more haunting a deception there is no one could know. No, I didn't know by virtue of understanding. I didn't know by revelation. That came later. I knew by experience, for I lived in fear. And that is not right. The false teaching I'd heard meant that I essentially lived in bondage to malevolent powers. I was not living in the joy and freedom of the Holy Spirit that Christ the King gives us. I didn't see or understand the world the way I should. I was paralyzed by the idea that there was a demon under every rock, round every corner, that people and places and objects and symbols were given such power in my mind that I feared. I feared the world, God's world. Without a proper theology of conversion, and a biblical view of the world, I was held captive to what I would call a kind of Christianized superstition, more akin actually to the Phoenician religion of the Maltese people we read about here in Acts 28 than to biblical truth. Sadly, I do come across Christian folk today who are similarly fearful of the world. They struggle to deal with the world around them and they're suspicious and they give the realm of darkness, which is real, a power that it doesn't rightly have. And it breaks my heart to see Christians as paralysed by fear as I once was. What we see in these ten short verses is how confident biblical Christianity plays out in a non-Christian environment. We don't need to fear. We don't need to fear the world. We don't need to fear forces of evil. For Christ is with us. So come with me through Acts 28. 
And verse 1, the story picks up with the wonderful fulfillment of the promise of God to all of those sailors when the angel came and spoke to them and, and said, everything's going to be okay. They were brought safely through in fulfillment of what was said. Having jettisoned all of their cargo to lighten the load of the ship and make it sit higher in the water uh, to reduce the risk of fouling the rocks and stuff, and they, they, they cast off the anchors, they loosed the lashings that held the rudders in place and set the sail to the wind and in order to drive the ship into this natural harbour that they saw ahead on this as yet unknown island. But the, sh- the ship did strike a reef and it was lodged, the bow was lodged and, and the violent and foaming seas behind it started to break up the back of the ship like it was matchwood. The sailors panicked. The soldiers, without orders, took up their swords and they were going to run all the prisoners through because if one of them was lost in Roman law, they would have had to have faced the punishment themselves on behalf of the prisoner. But mercifully, the centurion regained control of the soldiers and ordered the swimmers to make for land. And for those who couldn't swim, they were to take hold of the broken bits of ship and allow the the surf to wash them ashore in safely. And so 276 passengers and crew were brought safely to the land. God's mercy towards them was wonderful. None were lost. And upon landing upon, uh, on the island, they discover that it's, it's Malta, the island of Malta. It's 60 miles south of Sicily. It's a well-known route that mariners would have known. But there in verse 2, Luke refers to the watching islanders as natives, barbaroi in the Greek, from which we get barbarian. But the word barbarian, as we know it today, probably conjures up a wrong image Uh, you know, uneducated, feral savages or something. But that's not what these people were. So the ESV translates it as uh, that they are natives. That's a good translation. These were advanced people. Barbaroi was simply this pejorative term that Greek speakers would use of those whose culture and language wasn't the Greco-Roman culture or language. Malta was actually a Roman colony. It was under Roman rule. But the people of North African descent, probably Carthaginians, they were proud of their roots. And that's a good thing. They wanted to hold on to who they were, and language is such an important part of that. So their first language was a Phoenician dialect, hence them being known here as natives. But the first thing we've got to say about these islanders was that they were very warm and hospitable people. 276 soggy, tired sailors. And although we may think of Malta as this idyllic Mediterranean holiday destination, you know, under the sun and the beach and everything else, actually, in these stormy conditions, yes, it does get cold. Wet clothes, exhaustion, you could easily catch a chill. So the islanders kindled a fire and welcomed them to their home. Now, although these were a very different people, culturally very different, religiously very different, they held to a kind of syncretistic, pagan, religious worldview on the island, Paul, nevertheless, was more than happy to receive their hospitality, their food, their water, to go into their homes. No fear. No fear of them as a people and no fear of their beliefs. Jesus is Lord He even mucks in and offers to help there in verse 3. He looks around and finds a bundle of sticks and picks it up in his arms and takes it over to the fire. Now, I'm sure you know that snakes are cold-blooded animals. And we've been told it's cold and stormy. The clouds and the rain were their canopy, not the bright Mediterranean sun. So the snake hidden in the bundle hadn't had an opportunity to warm its blood in the sunshine yet. And so it was slow, unresponsive. 
But then the second Paul dumps the bundle down onto the fire, that little bit of warmth from the flames was enough to, to snap the snake into action and its fight or flight instincts just kicked in and there it fastened onto his hand and bit him. Verse 4. When the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. And notice justice there is capitalised. In their mythology, uh, the goddess DK was the goddess of justice, the spirit of moral order. And the Greek word here is DK. There is a feminine personal pronoun, so the capitalization is correct. The goddess of moral order, the goddess justice, was in their eyes judging Paul. He was lucky to escape from Neptune and the sea, but there's no escape for moral transgressors from DK. Paul must have been a murderer. That's their only explanation for the shipwreck and of course he was a murderer but they were wrong the gods are against him the shipwreck and the viper this doesn't look good they see the misfortune and they interpret it as divine judgment but then the second they realize that Paul hasn't fallen foul of the venom from the snake they change their minds and conclude that he must be some kind of god do you see how their their worldview operates here They are the ones who believe in and give power to spiritual forces under every rock, in every negative or positive circumstance. Their superstition made them fearful of everything. Every action, every blast of wind, every every creature in the world, every place, every person. It's got a meaning. There's some lurking malevolent power behind it all. And through their divination, they were trying to look beyond the mantle of the visible to assert what must be going on with this God or that God. And that, that worldview, is here set in direct contrast to Paul and Luke, who knew the living God. The God who reveals himself, who is not hidden. The God who is known, the God who can be seen, who you could touch. The God who was earthed in Jesus Christ. Jesus speaks about how the cosmos works. Jesus, what he says he is and what he does he says and what he says he does. The Lord predicts and it happens. This Lord raises the dead with a word and with a word he stills the storm. The true God, the one in whom they have complete confidence to live fearlessly with freedom wherever they go, even to pagan Malta. In Christ, they've been raised above all those spiritual forces. We have nothing to fear. So these men have freedom to receive this pagan hospitality, to love them, to serve them, to not pass judgment against them or see any need to interpret their situation. God is God. He is sovereign and we are his people. It's so lovely that we can just rest in that and not trouble ourselves with these other thoughts. When we're in Christ, we are held, we are secure and we're in the hand of the God of the universe. It's the best place to be. I remember a few years ago, uh, you'll maybe remember this as well, when the Somerset levels flooded, uh, a prominent self-styled prophet declared that this flooding was divine judgment against Great Britain for passing the same-sex marriage bill. Like, how petty and powerless does he think God really is? A few soggy living rooms... When God judges with a flood, we've got to think of Noah. That's the power of the true God. It is simply coming from fear. Fear of the non-Christian world. Trying to peek beyond the veil and judge what is not meant to be known. Rather than trusting in the sovereignty of God. It's also unhelpful for evangelism. A media that loves to pick up on the stories 
of small-minded preachers, and they went to town on it at the time. Well, Paul just got on with life. He shook off the serpent, he dried off his clothes, and even just there in in, in the the, the shaking off of the serpent, this is wonderful picture of the ultimate and total lordship of Christ. For the serpent brought death and ruin into the world at a tree. And at the tree of the cross of Christ, the serpent was judged and is now thrown down. And by the same wood of the tree, it is burning in its eternal fire. That's a big view of God. A liberating view of the world. Paul wasn't afraid of these people. He wasn't afraid of their religion. He didn't think like them, of course. He didn't want to know anything about that. He was was just getting on with what he does. He knew the real God. He knew his mighty power. And that gave him the freedom simply to receive the kindness of these people without judging them. Brothers and sisters, we don't need to fear the world. Whether we're serving a mission in far-flung island nations or serving here in Worthing, we've nothing to fear. In fact, maybe the simple receiving of the kindness of those of other faiths might just be the best way for us to communicate to them what we believe. We don't need to be afraid of Phoenician pagans or Freemasons or occultists, or Hindus. We don't need to stay clear of Muslims, or Druids, or atheists, or Buddhists. Jesus is Lord. They are our fellow human beings, deceived by false religions. They need to hear of Jesus. And we must use words. But let's also obey Jesus and be good neighbors to them as Paul was, unburdened by any fear of what they believe in, and let us live to serve them and share what we know about the true God. And this is where solid theology is just such a delight for us. It's so liberating. Friends, remember the doctrine of union with Christ this morning. If you are in Christ, in Christ, you are part of him you are one with him and so one with the father we are in christ by faith by the converting work of the holy spirit we are placed there in jesus christ and can christ be attacked or overpowered by evil no can the holy spirit of god be overshadowed by a created spirit no he cannot Jesus has his foot on the neck of the serpent and we are in him and one with him. We are kings and queens of this earth, a royal priesthood made holy, appointed to rule and judge all things in the age to come, even the angels. Hold on to this. This is truth. It is good and it is liberating. Don't live in fear. Be a good neighbor. And let us, as a church, seek to be at least as kind and welcoming to outsiders as these Maltese natives were, if not more so. Verse 7. Now, in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the chief man of the island named Publius, who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. So this hospitality was more than just sharing an umbrella for a few hours. This was opening up their homes for days. What a high standard of hospitality. And while they're there in the home of Publius, they learn of his father's illness, which Dr. Luke helpfully diagnoses as fever and dysentery. Now, just as an aside... This was and still is a well-known sickness in the Mediterranean. It goes by the name of Malta fever, or maybe you've heard of it as Cyprus fever. And in 1887, the particular microorganism, uh, the Brucella bacteria, was discovered, and it was traced back to the milk of Maltese goats. That's, that's, That's real science, and it's there in the Bible. 
The Bible is real. Anyway, they, they created a vaccine off of the back of that. But of course, Dr. Luke had no such vaccine available to him. But actually, he did have a living apostle, which is way better. Now, although the modern day vaccine, it does work, the bacteria and hence the symptoms can persist in the body for months. But here, the man is healed instantly. Paul lays his hands on Publius's father, praying to the real God, the God and father of his Lord Jesus Christ, and the man was healed instantly. I could have done with a bit of that this morning. Now, although in this narrative there's no explicit word of Paul and Luke preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus Christ on Malta, and there's no mention of Paul refuting that Maltese view that he was some kind of God, this is one of those occasions I believe we have to be reasonable and recognize that Luke doesn't have to give us all the details of every trip they make and everything that goes on. He's already established for us the pattern and priorities for Paul and his group. The surrounding context in Acts establishes his character for us so we can assert with confidence that Paul proclaimed the gospel on this island. Of course he would have preached. David Peterson says in his commentary on this, quote, Luke sometimes offers brief narratives in succession to longer ones, where it is natural to assume that Paul was saying similar things to those previously recorded. For example, in chapter 14, verses 1 to 7, chapter 17, verses 10 to 12, chapter 19, verses 8 to 10. As this travel narrative moves to its climax, the development of friendly relationships with pagans should not be taken to exclude the possibility of evangelism, end quote. Of course, Paul would have preached. Luke, however, decides to emphasize here the healings for us, which is fair enough. These were a people who were very focused on circumstances revealing things. In contrast to modern Britons, they, the Maltese, thought about powers and thrones and gods and demigods. They thought about that sort of stuff all the time in creation. They think that when a snake bites you, it's judgment for moral failure. So what are they going to make of this mass healing? Because literally everyone on the island, I love that, everyone on the island who was sick, verse 9, was brought to them and they were healed. Praise the Lord. Obviously, in their thinking, they'd be like, wow, these guys really do know what they're talking about. Let's listen to about their God. This God has power, real power. I love God's wisdom here in using the weakness of the worldview of these pagan Maltese people, their fallen understanding of the world, as a way for for Luke and Paul to point back to Jesus through these healings. It's stunning. This mutual exchange of acts of kindness built bridges for the church in this pagan land. Paul didn't think ill of these people. He would certainly have disagreed with what they thought and sought to teach them. But regardless, he was kind and there was no fear. And the Maltese people likewise honoured them greatly with many honours. Loading up the ship, this presumably is a new ship, not a repaired one a ship that's come in in less dangerous conditions and was going to be sailing up to Rome. Now, we may wonder, had the, apost- had the apostle and his friends been abrasive, condescending, condemning of the pagan hosts, I wonder if they'd have been quite so successful. If they feared them and kind of stayed away and hunkered down in a Christian bubble on the island because they didn't understand or like what they believed and their Phoenician religion... I wonder, would they have been sent off with such abundant provisions? I doubt it. Here, then, is a lesson for us on our island. Okay, it's not as warm here, but it is just as irreligious, just as different in terms of a prevailing worldview, a way of thinking and understanding the cosmos. 
Actually, our culture is incredibly close to the Greco-Roman cultures of, of the first century in terms of sexuality, in terms of relationships, spirituality, and their view of the human body. And, and today, I mean, you look at this and you think, wow, this is really, people are getting on here even though they disagree. And today, it just seems everyone's yelling at each other. And on Twitter, it's disgraceful. And in the Houses of Parliament, it's disgraceful. Everyone's just shouting past each other. Is there any way we can talk through issues without the things we say being weaponized and turned into hate speech? How about we blaze a trail, like Paul did here, of kindness and hospitality? Where we can model that disagreement doesn't mean disdain. Where we can discuss, we can debate, but still be hospitable and warm and, and open up our homes to people we disagree with. Helping our fellow man despite their views. We can still do that and hold to an orthodox view of scripture, of marriage, of Jesus, of heaven and of hell. It doesn't mean that we hate everybody out there who disagrees with us. Far from it. We don't fear them. We don't fear their thinking. We fear for them. And that is why we do all that we can to lovingly and helpfully point them to Jesus. Our freedom in Christ and his lordship means we can go into places where people are, people who need Jesus, without being scared of what they believe or, or the religion that they hold to. We can rest in the divine kindness and sovereignty and providence of a God who loves us and loves his church a God who has secured our success and our survival by the blood of the cross of Christ. If we remember the doctrine of union with Christ, we can walk in this world with heads held high without fear and be kind. Be kind and witness to the goodness of God in our lives. Amen.